So, let's continue. I must say that there is a reason why we began our studies specifically with the North Scandinavian myth and by devoting so much time to it. As the mechanisms of distinction between what is important and unimportant, right or wrong, that we have extracted from the Norse myths, and after having developed them to perfection, we will apply them to all other myths. And this will make it easy for you not to get entangled in complex intricacies. Why this? Because if we compare the Norse myth to all others, including the later ones, then we will see, understand and appreciate how easy it is to comprehend. Much easier than all the rest. First of all, the northern world is pretty straightforward. Straightforward and concrete. There are no mysterious, deep, multidimensional narratives compared to, for instance, Greek mythology. But most importantly, the Norse myth clearly points out the presence of a certain fact within the narrative by highlighting it as a major key factor. If you analyze the entire North mythology, you will see that there is not a single myth that narrates about a specific god from the beginning to the end, that is, from the moment of his birth to his death. As a rule, the narrative begins and ends only when significant facts occur, that is, at the moment when the deity manifests herself, or this deity's certain property of some kind, a cataclysm that takes place. And that's where the Norse myth truly differs from all other myths. It does not allow unnecessary narratives that have nothing to do with the algorithm that this god is carrying. It immediately shows us what, in this information, is important and remarkable. Moreover, this myth does not suggest that an already completed event can be somehow replayed in the future. Unlike, for example, the same Greek, Roman and Celtic myths which show through their narrative that everything can be changed. Everything can be transformed throughout the course of life and that today's mistake can be corrected as well as today's advantages negated. And why is that? Because these myths, while containing a component with a lengthy narrative, tell us exactly how to change an already existing constant. How to change already inscribed algorithms. This is what they are intended for. Let's take the Greek myth, for instance. While working for the proto-foundation life, it could manifest itself in any other way. Because life is long, it goes on, and anything can happen. There can be numerous lives, and none of them should be considered completed because they are not. In fact, there is still an afterlife, and they say it can also be pretty eventful. This is in contrast with the Norse myth, which lacks any variability. If something happened, it actually did. Why is that? Because the Norse myth focuses on the proto-foundations of order and tradition. Accordingly, what is inscribed within it is inscribed once and for all. And the myth shows this to us, reflecting and telling us what proto-foundations activate when we work with the Norse myth. And when it formed, it formed as a scaffolding, a foundation, a sort of skeleton. This is why the tree of the Norse myth cannot be affected by mistletoe. It is when the actual interaction between the worlds, between various cultures begins, that the mistletoe gains strength in all its potential and manifestations. The Norse myth is concrete, ruthless, 
It does not provide an opportunity to replay what has been done, and if something is done, it is done forever. And it is now a defined condition for the next step. And this step is not designed to correct the previous error. It is a logical consequence of the committed error, or vice versa. It is a logical consequence of the gained victory. And here the cause and effect connection is very strict. It doesn't allow any variability. The norms weave only once and never unravel their threads. They never replay what has already occurred. And this is why the Norse myth is beautiful and frightening at the same time. It is reminiscent of northern nature. This is where they mirror each other. Inescapable, ultimate, and as a matter of fact. For this reason, by studying the Norse myth, we teach ourselves to see this skeleton a skeleton of facts. Because in reality, after we see these facts in any other myth, we will be able to understand the true key moments that remain unaltered within the myth, passed on from myth to myth, from legend to legend, from one narrative to another. And we will be able to distinguish them from temporary facts, momentary, that serve more for the entourage, for the depictional richness or interest instead of the informational knowledge of any other myth. Now the Norse myth gives us a certain vision, a certain mindset. All the legends that we study at the runic department, and here of course, carry the exact same property of reflecting only what is important. Fundamental. They do that with the least amount of words, with the least amount of emotions, only within the limits of permissible necessity of these emotions for a better assimilation of the myth. But by no means for entertainment, neither as food for thought, nor for philosophizing, but for a clear and concrete understanding.